So this is our final panel of today, but fear not, we'll be back tomorrow, and we're going to have a great panel for you. Uh, first, let me bring out our, my fellow Trek experts. I'm Mark A. Altman, and my co-hosts are Ashley Edward Miller and Darren Docterman. Hello. Come Hello. On out. There you go. Of course, you know Darren is the associate producer of the Star Trek The Motion Picture Director's Edition. Ashley's the screenwriter of Thor and X-Men First Class, showrunner of Dota Dragon's Blood. And you may know my work from The Librarians in Pandora and the best-selling oral histories of Star Trek The 50-Year Mission. And today... And writer-producer of Free Enterprise. And the producer of Free Enterprise. Thank you. And, and writer. And... Um, we are delighted today to welcome a very special guest. Um, we're going to be looking at a once-in-a-lifetime, unprecedented auction of some of the greatest Star Trek props and miniatures and costumes ever assembled. Uh, sadly, it is the result of the passing of the great Greg Jean uh, about a little over a year ago, and he had the most remarkable collections going up for auction, and from Heritage Auctions, we have um, the VP of Communications and Marketing and Publicity, Robert Wolanski. So, Robert, welcome. Thank you. What an honor. <clears throat> um, if you don't, uh, by the way, there's, there's stuff up here if you need it. Catalog, uh, direct mailer, if you want to look as we uh, play along here. We have a little sampler of what you'll find now, in the auction. It's like a poo poo platter. Only even different. if you don't have a spare million dollars to buy some of the stuff at auction, it is fascinating. It is uh, uh, Hollywood history. It is. More than that, it is our history as a culture of pop culture, and um, I want, we're going to talk about some of the items today. Uh, when are you officially announcing the auction? So you're getting a very sneak peek at all of this, a uh, little preview. It doesn't open until September 8th, Star Trek Day, and the auction takes place October 14th and 15th in Dallas. So if you are in or around Dallas, feel free to come by. The preview begins September 26th. Big story in the AP that'll uh, have appeared by this time. Yeah, this is a big thrill. This is, um, it's such a thrill that I decided we could talk about it early just with the three of you. Yeah, that's, look, we're, 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 we're so happy because I know you haven't, it hasn't officially been announced yet, and it's great to be able to talk about it here at Galaxy Hunt because they're really, to say there's not been nothing like this before is true. There have been auctions I, when Paramount, um, of, after Enterprise, sold off everything, or most of what they had in in the archives, uh, it doesn't even compare to what the Greg Jean collection is that's happening right now. Well, I mean, Greg was a, for everybody who knows, Greg worked on myriad Star Trek projects, beginning with the 1977, the TV show that wasn't. He worked on the, uh, the motion picture, he worked on all the television series, he worked on everything pretty much. But, you know, he's a, he was Oscar nominated twice, both for Steven Spielberg. He did, he designed with Ralph McQuarrie, the mothership from Close Encounters, the maquette of which is in this auction. He worked on 1941 with Spielberg, also Oscar nominated for that, and Star Trek Oscar nominated, I mean Star Trek Emmy nominated, and for Angels in America. So the man had an incredibly long and wide-ranging career. As you well know, you, you knew Greg. I, I knew Greg, and the, the great part about it was, even before he started working in the industry, he was a, a fan of Star Trek specifically, and many Many other things. But in the late 60s, like around 1969, he was working with the people at Lincoln Enterprises, which of course was uh, Majel's uh, company that would sell all sorts of things from Star Trek, including film, film clips, clips mm -hmm. and uh, scripts and, and all sorts of uh, other tchotchkes, that's the technical term. Uh, but uh, he was you know, well ensconced with that, and he knew Gene, and he knew Majel. And uh, he, at that point, had started collecting detritus from the original show, and from Batman, and from uh, other things that he uh, really enjoyed. He, he really enjoyed the Green Hornet. Uh, he really enjoyed the Shadow, the radio shows. And he was just a, 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 an incredible fan of all of this stuff that we love. And he was always willing to share his enthusiasm with everybody, which was awesome. He was the sweetest guy in the world. He would, uh, he would do anything for you if he could. Um, 
But the, the way his collection started was very simple, but he was also sort of very peculiar about what he protected and what he kept. How so? Well, he, he put everything in his house and, the, and, and, and didn't let the sun uh, hit it ever. Um, but uh, the other thing was that uh, he would sometimes restore uh, these uh, items that he, he procured, and uh, no one would know that they had uh, been damaged at all. Um, and uh, the great thing was that he, uh, no matter how messy or uh, uh, big the accumulation of things, he knew where everything was. It's, uh, it's kind of fantastic, his, uh, his memory about this stuff and, and where he got it and, and uh, you know, where it was first used and all this sort of stuff. It was really amazing. Robert, my knowledge of auctions is largely um, comes from watching like Octopussy and uh, That's, I, I North by get Northwest. That, yeah. So I, I would love to hear how exactly the process works, how the collection, in this case, the Greg Jean collection comes to you, how, how it's valued, and then how the auction proceeds. If you can just sort of take us through how I'm happy to. So Heritage has been around since 1976. It was the first auction house to actually be online. So you don't have to be there to bid. You can do it on your computer. You can go to ha.com and you can watch the auction. You can bid in in fact, starting September 8th, you can begin the bidding. So the live auction is the 14th and 15th. It's divvied into two sessions. The catalog is in two parts, as, as you see there. Look, it's this came to Heritage because several employees at Heritage were very good friends with Greg. In fact, Brian Chanis, who works at Heritage, spoke at his funeral mm -hmm. last year. So it's very simple. Everybody knew Greg at Heritage, and when he died last year, um, it sort of came to us that way. And everybody, look, I mean, this is not our first rodeo when it comes to Star Trek stuff. We we sold the phaser rifle from right. the cage last year for... Where six, no man has gone before. I mean, nowhere no man has gone before for 645000 Wow. Something like that. Could have bought two for that price. Nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but look, it's, you know, it's... I've seen a couple of phasers come through. And look, I gave up a 30-year profession in print journalism to go to work at Heritage for stuff like this. Yeah. I mean, you and I met, Mark, I should say, 25, 30 years ago when I did a piece on Star Trek for Salon. I'm, I have, I've, I'm a, bit of, a big fan of Trek Navigator, which I thumb through uh, on great occasion. So, and you and I met, Darren, 23 years ago when you were yeah. doing Star Trek The Motion Picture for the right. first time. The first round, yeah. First so, many. I love all of this as much as I love anything in the world. It is, it's a thrill for me just to be here with you guys talking about this and to be with everybody talking about Greg and Star Trek. But the fact that we have the only existing Botany Bay. Mm -hmm. Those Botany Bay? <laughs> I know, I walk around the office going, Botany Bay, <laughs> Botany Bay, and my colleagues are, they think I'm insane. But, but you don't have the horrible belt buckles with the rubber. No, that, that, that's not wrong. We do not, but we have the, the styrofoam cube, the salt, the, uh, there's a lot of stuff. The Kelvins, yeah. yeah. Well, let's, let's talk about, about it. Crew member. What are some of the things, like from a personal perspective, that you're most excited about uh, going up to auction? Because we have the catalog right here. And, I mean, it's just... Well, there's 560 lots in the auction, but that 560 lots include, like, one of the lots is several hundred unseen production photographs from a single episode. I think uh, there's stuff from a number of episodes from motion picture, from many of the movies. There's a whole ream of photographs just of... Um, Michelle Nichols. I mean, there's a whole lot of stuff in here. There's costumes worn by pretty much everybody in every TV show and every film. For me, it's a big thrill. We had the AP in the other day, and for me, it was just a big thrill to see every single Shatner costume mm -hmm. from the original series all the way to Star Trek Generations. I mean, we have the jacket from Wrath of Khan. I mean, just to see that jacket mm -hmm. is incredibly important to me. To see the vest from Mirror Mirror, to see the formal wear from the court martial, and the, the casual wraparound. There's another remarkable piece of Shatner that you have up for auction. 
Well, I mean, all right. So Darren asked me, do you have, what, what box was it in? It was in a Max Factor, a brown cardboard Max Factor box. And the reason I know this, because I got to visit Greg at his house about a month before he died. And we were, you know, a couple of friends of mine and I uh, visited him, and he was very sweet, and he was, you know, he was glad for the company. And uh, he was showing us all this stuff that he had, and I, all these, uh, he was enjoying our attention to this stuff with him. Later in the afternoon, Greg says to me, hey, Darren, why don't you go into that, uh, that second bedroom down the hall, uh, reach up on this shelf and grab the box that's on there and bring it in here. So I did. And it was, like I said, this Max Factor box. And we opened it up. It was like opening the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> and we opened it up. And there in the box was in perfect condition Season 3 Shatner hairpiece. <laughs> It was beautiful. And it looked, it, you look at it and you say, oh my God, that's his hair. It's here. They scalped him. <laughs> it, was, it was amazing. So I told this today to a Star Trek actor of some renown. I mentioned that we had William Shatner's hairpiece. And he asked me very specifically, was it his real life hairpiece or was it his work hairpiece? I said, no, it's the, the season three. He goes, well, you know the story that Shatner would drive to work, take off his hair so he could put on his other hair. And we have his other hair. And the funny thing is every time I try to show it to somebody in the catalog, I immediately turn to a triple page. Because <laughs> they are very identical. It's Except the hairpiece is pristine. <laughs> right. And it's combed. It, it looks like Shatner is in a box. It's real I, and it's magnificent. That's right. I find that unsettling. And it also <laughs> purrs. It's really nice. <laughs> Sounds like a pigeon. And what's great, you talk about all the costumes, but there's so much beautiful stuff from the cage. You know, um, the phaser. Yeah. Now, for those of you who don't know, the cage featured a guy named Captain Pike, and then there was like somebody named Number One, and uh, Lieutenant Ortega, who was a dude. Right. Uh, it was just Ortega. Ortega. But, yeah, you, I mean, they're tr obviously tricorders, phasers. They're tr wait, so the page you have, fa yeah, the other, right here. The inside page. The inside this one, side. yeah, the inside page. Oh, your inside voice. Oh, wait, dude. Which, uh, the Vulcan loot. Yes. Yes. Oh, I was just looking at that. The Vulcan yes. loot. There's which, the Vulcan loot. Which, of course, uh, Spock played in numerous episodes, including the classic Everyone Loves the Way to Eden. Um, yeah, brother. But first in Charlie X, I believe, I think. Here it is. Was, the, uh, the Vulcan. Maybe was. The fascinating thing about the loot, it's the only thing in the auction that has a copyright Paramount Pictures on the back of it, 1969 Paramount, because it was clear that they intended at some point to mass manufacture, That's and fast. they never did. And can they you imagine did. the groovy music that would have been made oh across gosh. this country with the Vulcan loot? I know. Wow. I mean, somebody could have had it at Woodstock. It would have changed the world. Um, th this is incredible. This just shows you the depth of his collection. This is um, the um, USS Antares crewman tunic from Charles. X, and the starting bid is, uh, starts at $2,500. Running the Antares was easy. <laughs> but, I mean, it, there's, it's not just the usual suspects. Um, oh, my God, and I didn't even see this. Batman's utility belt. Several. So Batman was the first thing that he really began collecting, as I understand it. In the 1960s, yeah. yeah, in the 1960s, that stuff was a few hundred dollars. And Larry Edmonds, who had a bookstore on Coanga, I believe, you could go in there, and he actually got some stuff from the different studios, including some Batman and Star Trek. So they had the utility belts from Adam West Batman. And Greg bought all of them. Yeah. And we have all of them in the auction. Batarangs, bat spray, all kinds of stuff. So if and you're going swimming and you need some bat shark repellent. We have no shark repellent, which is very disappointing. Right. Because that's from the movie and they that get that correct. stuff separate. That is right. For some reason. But I mean, look, so you and I were talking about this today. Greg got a lot of this stuff 
in many different ways. He was an early collector. He would go to the early conventions. Yeah. He was obviously in the trade. So guys like, oh, I made that ship. Oh, I'd like to have that ship. I'd like to restore that ship. Can you give me that ship? Here's right. that ship. Then he was also, he was rescuing from studios because most of this stuff, if not all of it, was never meant to survive. Right. The Botany Bay was Let's never meant to survive to 2023. It was made for a moment. It was meant to be tossed out. Greg rescued it because he knew its value. He had great affection for it. And he certainly wanted to study it as well because as a kid, he had been a model maker. Yep. So he would go, there, in this auction is a 1942, is a bus, a double-decker bus miniature from a 1942 Laurel and Hardy film, one of their very last films for Fox. So in 1975, I believe, Fox was destroying the ranch, which is now the Malibu State Park. Yeah. Right. So Greg heard that they were going to demolish the storage facility. Storage where, compartments, storage the, compartments. Yeah, so he went out there and he said, I'll give you X amount of money to spend X amount of days rescuing before the bulldozers show up. And he's pulling this stuff out of, as I've been told by his family, while the bulldozers are coming. Mm -hmm. Like, he's getting everything he can rescue. Like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Exactly. Well, it's interesting because I'd like to say this is a time when Hollywood did not value the past. But, you know, that's kind of the way it is now. But I, I, at least now they, they hold on to the stuff because they figure there's some value in it. But back then, it, it, you know, there were all these flats of, like, Tara from Gone with the Wind. And these, th these things often get thrown out. You know, when MGM was sold, all, all this Hollywood history ended up in a dumpster. And we're lucky that so many of these people, like, right, were dumpster divers. They would hear Paramount was throwing out something or whatever, and they would go to the studio, and they would save this stuff. We owe them such a debt of gratitude because all this stuff would be lost. Because remember, there, at that Here's time, the there, were, that there were so few people collecting this stuff because it, it just, first of all, it wasn't available generally, and uh, there hadn't been a market developed for it, and the studios didn't care because they only value the final you know, product, the films or the television shows. And, uh, and so they were throwing this stuff away left and right. Uh, the, famously, MGM had a, uh, basically a landfill that they filled up. Far be it for me to be fair to the studios in 2023, but uh, the other thing to remember about some of this stuff is that, number one, they, they never really knew what they had, and number two, they had to keep it someplace, and number three, uh, real estate in Los Angeles. Um, so, I mean, you kind of look at it, you know, from, from that point of view, it just, it feels very often like film is a, is a disposable art. Um, and it's, I think, largely driven by the fact that it's, uh, it's incredibly hard to, to archive this stuff, like whether it's props or it's models or it's costumes. Um, and it really has been, you know, people like Greg uh, who just take an interest in finding that stuff, whether it's Star Trek related, you know, or it's, you know, My Fair Lady. It's like there's, there's somebody out there who goes, that has value to me personally. I find it beautiful. Um, and those people become those initial collectors who kind of make this kind of thing possible. Well, I know what I've got here. And I'm looking at 21 production photos of Yvonne Craig as Batgirl from Batman. It's a, a starting bid of $500. But it makes me remember, uh, Greg Jean used to send out these Christmas cards. And uh, these Christmas cards were very, you know, bawdy. Um, usually there was a naked woman uh, draped around like Robbie the Robot or some kind of sci-fi icon. And, uh, I, you know, it was always you'd get them every Christmas and you kind of look forward to them because they were always very creative. And um, this is just, uh, you know, it's so remarkable, you know, and, and, and scripts, you know, various different drafts of episodes. And, you know, a lot of the Star Trek stuff exists thanks to Gene Roddenberry, who donated a lot of his stuff to UCLA, but not all of it is in the collection. And, you know, so much of that is, you know, now up for sale. And I mean, here it's even the progenitor of Star Trek. Look at this. The Forbidden Planet five-piece crew uniform, starting bid $4,000. This is, you know, the, the um, Forbidden Planet uniform, which was, you know, obviously huge inspiration to Gene um, on 
on Star Trek, and we, we did an episode of the podcast on Forbidden Planet's influence on Star Trek. And not that he'd ever admit it. Not that he ever admitted it. He denied it. Um, I mean, it, the license plate from the Batmobile, the Bat One, Gotham City. I mean, it. Do you got, think he went to the DMV for that? Yeah, he paid extra. Okay, but he could afford it. He stood in line. He was Bruce Wayne. Yeah, so he could afford to pay extra. Um, Here is look at this, the captain's, uh, the the green wraparound, the green Green. uniform. Um, That's the first wraparound, I believe. He has both. Of course he did. Of course he does. I mean, it's 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 extraordinary. I'm looking at there's a tricorder here. Um, He had two. He had two because in case what happens to one, you got to have a second one. But of Greg, it was interesting because I heard these stories that Greg, he became the chief sort of, he was the guy that if you had a phaser, you came to and said, "Is this a real phaser?" Right. Greg apparently had a giant box full of fake phasers because when people brought him over, he said, "No, that's junk," and he'd throw it in the fake phaser box. But there was a point where someone uh, fooled him for a certain amount of time. Yeah. And he had a bunch of these that they thought were real. And finally it came out that no, this guy was making almost perfect replicas of stuff and Greg found that he had paid a lot of money for fakes. Mm. But they're still beautiful. Yeah. You know, that's the thing. He enjoyed all of this stuff, no matter if it was fake or not. Preserved in almost perfect detail. That's right. Um, $4,000 starting bid. Mark Leonard's Romulan Commander. It's a three-piece uniform ensemble, of course, from Balance of Terror. I mean... In another reality, we could have called him friend. It's just stunning. And then, I mean, here we are. Th- look at the shuttlecraft. And, the, the, you know, the story behind the shuttlecraft is obviously so fascinating. Um, how they didn't have a life-size shuttlecraft or, or filming miniature, which they needed, and only by making a deal with AMT model kits, um, and in exchange for the license, they created the, the miniature as well as the life-size uh, uh, set. Um, and it's gorgeous. And the, the shuttlecraft, oh, this is, this is heartbreaking. This is a starting bid of $60,000. But oh my I left God. it in my other pants. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, someone is going to be very happy when they, and I, I have a feeling this is going to go for a lot more than sixty thousand oh, yeah. dollars. Well, I mean, the 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 shuttlecraft, the body bay, the X wing, the stormtrooper costume, the two thousand one uni- uh, outfit. Yeah. it's one of the few surviving two thousand one. It's the helmet all the way to the backpack, the front pack, the whole costume. Very fragile, most of it. But the fact is, look, I. It's a weird thing to be around this stuff. And I look, if you're any, since we're in Austin, I assume y'all can drive down to Dallas and see this stuff. Drive up to Dallas, sorry. I went to school here, you'd think I know better. Um, you should see it, because once you see it, it really does add a different dimension to our affection for these things. Yeah. I mean, to hold a phaser, to look at the only Botany Bay ever made, and certainly to see it all these years later is a really remarkable feeling. There is something magic that these items possess. No matter how beat up they may be, no matter how faded these, some of these costumes are, most of them looked like they just stepped off the set because Greg really preserved this stuff extraordinarily well. He had but, racks and racks of yeah. costumes that he kept. And to see it all in person, and to be around it, and to look at, to stand eye to eye with that stormtrooper when it's assembled, is a truly otherworldly experience, as it were. And it's so important, Rob makes such a good point, because you look, you know, people, some people were first discovering Star Trek with something like Strange New Worlds, with its $15 million budget and all the advances. You know, look back and say, oh, the old Star Trek was cheesy, or whatever. You look at all the imagination and creativity that went into Star Trek, and how brilliant, and how everything stands on the shoulders of giants. Uh, uh, The imagination on display, with the limited resources that they had, other than and just immense creativity and talent. Wa Chang, um, Matt Jeffries, all these people. Um, and it's incredible. And uh, I mean, this is the depth of the collection. I mean, this is extraordinary. They have the teacher from Spock's brain. I only can imagine <laughs> how he ended up with that. $8,000 is the starting bid. This is that, you know, uh, McCoy puts it on to uh, educate himself how to A child reconnect could do it. Uh, Spock's brain. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, 
It's extraordinary. It's like, how did this ever get saved? And it also has the the um, control pads, the eye morgues wear uh, in Spock's brain. Now this is a thousand dollars. The givers of pain and delight. But it's so memorable from this episode. Um, it's just extraordinary, but even the deep, because we've seen like, yeah, uniforms have gone on sale, phasers, all you expect that, right? But this is the we illuminating the switch box from For the World is Hollow and I Have Touched the Sky, starting bid $1,500. Look, on that, on that front page that you just had, the universal translator from uh, 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 Arena. Arena. But it doesn't work. It won't, it won't work no. for you. But, but that, that shot that you have in the catalog is exactly when Shatner is saying, I'm engaged in personal combat with a creature apparently called a Gorn. It's it's so iconic, and it's right there, and it's amazing. And who knows what dirt got in that thing from Vasquez. It has Shatner's fingerprints and Vasquez Roxas dirt on it. <laughs> we have also have the, the, the Gorn hands, by the way. Yes. And then who wouldn't want this? This is the Klingon Battlecruiser. This is a test model miniature from Star Trek Phase Two, the never-made TV show from the mid-'70s. This has a starting bid of $6,000. It's a, basically, it is the Klingon D7, the reason they didn't have the miniature around anymore, so he recreated it for the yeah. model test. It's, it's, it's gorgeous. Because the original's in the Smithsonian. Because it's as it has And that's actually one that Greg made. That's when yeah. Greg first got employed to work on Star Trek. The thing that he loved more than anything was for phase two. Yeah. And of course, if you're worried about COVID, there's the Zenite mining gas mask from uh, the Cloud Minders, starting bid $2,500. And look at this. I mean, it's just, I mean, I just, I, I, you know, I hear the stories and I've heard the stories and I wonder how did, I mean, just, Everything, just from every kind of 79 episodes. I mean, cloud minders. This is the weapon. Here's Jeff Corey holding the the the, the mining tool, the cloud miners. I said dig. I mean, and these aren't even good episodes. And who would <laughs> want them? <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's easy to say I want stuff from City on the Edge of Forever. I'm going to go get that. But you know, it's like he has. No matter what the episode is, he has. I mean, the Klingon disruptor pistol is here, starting bid uh, twenty thousand dollars. That thing has got. It's got way too. It's a beautiful thing to hold. And it works. You know what you doesn't work? You know what disappointingly doesn't work? The agonizer from Mirror Mirror. Yeah. But we do have it. For it yeah. We do have it. I'm sure it'll cause someone agony when they bid too much for it. <laughs> well, you can always buy the knife that goes with it. That's right. That is uh, great. And it's only volume one of the catalog. I'm, I'm going to look at some of the other things. What are your personal favorites, Rob? Of the, of, let's, let's just say, say you had very deep pockets, so you could just, you, you could say, I want this, 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 and this. What are, what are some of the highlights of the collection? Do you if I had deep pockets, and having spent 30 years in journalism, I do not have deep pockets. I'm lucky I have pockets. But if I could, it's a weird thing. I, like, I don't, somebody asked me the other day, a reporter from the AP said, what would you buy if you could? And it's, the three of you know this, everybody who's here knows this, you can't pick one, two, five, ten things. Because it would be the Galileo, it would be Botany Bay, but it would also be a communicator. Yeah. It would be the agonizer, it would be the universal translator, it would be Uhura's earpiece. It would be the Kirk's jacket from Wrath of Khan. It would be any number of pieces. I mean, there's also an X-Wing. I mean, it's red, it's red, red one, red one red is leader. in there, red leader, um, which was also used for some of red five shots too. I mean, I, God, I'd like to have a utility belt. I mean, I loved all this stuff. But as it much doesn't as have the shark repellent. It's not complete. What happens if you run into sharks? Especially on land. Then I am screwed. That's right. Yeah. Ashley, I know for you, it has to be the moon base alpha tunics. Oh, yeah. And he doesn't just have um, Chris, Chris Cooling, Space 1999. Pretty cool, huh? So um, he got the um, various moon base alpha. Does it have like the swing line stapler ray gun? Well, I'm looking. It has, okay. you know, the, the, um, the helmets. And does it have the, uh, the pistol? I believe so, yes. Oh, sweet. Man. I would like to... 
I would have love, Maya like, the shapeshifter. I would love to have Aaron Gray's helmet from Battle from Buck Rogers because I loved the way that thing looked, and I also have a very nice autographed picture of Aaron Gray hanging. That's funny because Darren would love to have Aaron Gray. Who um, wouldn't? No. Who wouldn't? Don't I'm, just put it all on me. I'm trying to be very reasonable in my expectations. Now. Uh, you know, once we get past Star Trek, I mean, Logan's Run, the Sandman outfit, starting bid $2,000, but it also has the hero gun, which is, you know, what we recreated for Free Enterprise, which almost lit Eric McCormick on fire, true story. <laughs> um, and, that's, and the tracker. What? And the tracker. And the tracker. The tracker was starting bid $1,000, and the, uh, the, the flame pistol, $4,000. And this is not from the TV series. This is from the actual but movie. But you can't bid on Sanctuary. No, because there is, there is no sanctuary. sanctuary. Um, and look at this gorgeous stuff from Close Encounters. The alien, you talked about this earlier, uh, the maquette of the alien mothership, $3,000. I think uh, that'll go for a lot more. Considering that the actual mothership is in the Smithsonian. Right? Yeah. Again. And you, you can't evade the turbo lasers because Death Star turbo laser cannon... $3,000. It's an actual turbo laser from Return of the Jedi. Um... I, I, it's just, I mean, and here's another. I mean, talk about kitschy, wonderful stuff. The sh now, I remember my parents when I asked for the Star Wars Early Bird, which was the famous set where they couldn't produce enough Star, Star Wars figures in 77 for Christmas. So they would send you an empty box, and then a couple, six months later, they send you the figures. My parents said, we're not getting you an empty box. Well, you know what? It's worth $1,500 now starting <laughs> bid. They screwed me. No, that's just the opening bid. I yeah, believe right, it's probably worth significantly bid. more than that. Now, the crazy thing is I asked you guys, what would you buy? And, you know, there's so much here I've seen. But, oh, my God, the, 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 the Colonial Viper from the original battle Star Galactic are starting bid $15,000. I mean, I have the Eagle Moss one, but it's not quite the same. Um, it's almost as rare, though. I, I mean, Cylon Raider, $15,000 um, starting bid. Um, the Hero Cylon from Galactica 1980, they'll pay you for it. Um, <laughs> no, starting bid, $8,000. I have a very funny story about the, we had some Cylon 80 stuff, uh, some Battlestar 80 stuff recently, and somebody bought it and was very disappointed because he, he, he bought stuff from the original Battlestar Galactica and was disappointed that it wasn't from Battlestar Galactica 80. What the hell? What was that? Well, I don't know. There's no accounting for taste. Um, it's interesting because he has the, this is fa famous, from Laser Blast, the Greg Jean uh, alien spaceship, um, uh, $2,000. And the thing is, this is where I first heard, of all things, this is where I first heard of Greg Jean, in the pages of Starlog, when Laser Blast was in production. Mm -hmm. And they did a whole article about Greg and the alien and the ship. And that's where I heard, oh, there's Greg Jean. I remember when I met him. I'm like, oh, my God, I met the guy who did Laser Blast. Last. Little did I know that, you know, all these years later, we'd be talking about him and his amazing collection. I didn't see it in there. Is the Dark Star in there? The Dark Star is in there. Nice. So you've got it the didn't dark... blow itself up? You've got the Dark Star. It's, a, it's this big. Oh, okay. It's it was John real. Carpenter's first film. Oh, yeah. yeah. And you've got all of the ships and the guns that he made for Flesh Gordon. Right. That was his first job. Oh, my you God. You said that right. You have Ranger 3 from Buck Rogers. That's right. Frozen by cosmic forces beyond imagination. That is incredible. Um, you know look we at have this. Have Thrown one. into an orbit a thousand times more vast. L Way I more vast. I cannot believe the Ranger 3 starting bid $6,000. Boy, I don't know how I'm going to tell my wife. Uh, <laughs> that the kids can't go to college. Now, sure, I heard you were divorced, Altman. Well, you know, I bought... <laughs> the Ranger 3. <laughs> I turned it into a martini shaker. The, yeah, they got the, the Starfighter, which is $10,000, right. which is much better than the model kit I built as a kid. The Draconian Hatchet Fighter. I would hope so. $10,000. It's, it's interesting, though, because a lot of the stuff in here is not starting at $5,000 or $15,000. Or, there's stuff in here that starts at five hundred, including the Enterprise name plate from First Contact, right. which I believe starts at $500. And it's an amazingly cool thing to see because it's every name on it is an actor from the film or somebody in production or Gene Roddenberry and so forth. That starts at $500. Now, granted, it won't go for that. No. But Especially there are, not now that people are listening to this podcast. But at least correct. you can feel good that you bid. 
You know, that's right. That's, I always like to say, I just got to experience the yeah. pleasure of not winning the auction. And you right. say, I was outbid. Oh, really? How much did it go for? $80,000. How much did you bid? Well, I, I 150. That's right. You, know? <laughs> um, you should see my bid history. It looks remarkably oh. similar to that. Yeah. Um, you know, Chris Cooling just did a wonderful series of episodes on his podcast, Forgotten TV, about V. And I see here they have a collection of over 100 sci fi television scripts, including V, Babylon 5, and and wait for it, Tales of the Gold Monkey, starting bid, $500. Chris, you better start saving up. Does he have the gold monkey? N well, Steve, Stephen Collins does. Oh, okay. Um, okay, too soon. Sorry. Yeah. It's uh, surprised he hasn't auctioned that yet. Oh, my God. All the V ships. Yeah, because Greg I, built them. I know, but it's just, it's, it's yeah, killing me. What do you me. think? It's like. <laughs> Bless you. It's like you could. You Mark, we'll let you spend the night at the, uh, at the at that that Heritage one night if you'd like. It'd be just like Night at the Museum, only different. The Martian War Machine maquette. This is just killing me. The Mars Federal Colony Police Helmet from Total Recall, five hundred dollars. Yeah. I mean, this really is for anybody who loves motion pictures and television. I mean, especially genre. I mean, this is this is just great. We barely touched on, you know, this is the Romulan um, from Next Generation, the one with the shoulder pads, the one that looks like it's Joan Crawford. Um, this is uh, $500, the Romulan walk-around costume from Paramount Park's Star Trek The Experience. Uh -huh. And that starts at $500. I mean, so, you know, uh, look, it's going to obviously go up. It's going to be... But, you know, you might just have a shot at that, maybe. Um, uh, you know, you won't be getting a lot of Christmas presents this year, but... Um, you get one big, great one. You got the tricorder. Well, there's, there's the Deep Space Nine doorbells. And, of course, uh, Greg worked on Trials and Tribulations, so he recreated a lot of classic stuff for um, that magnificent episode of Deep Space Nine. Um, but here's some nice Deep Space Nine, the Bajoran fa Phaser, $1,000. Um, a Garrick's Cardassian phase disruptor, $1,000 starting bid. Um, and of course, as you mentioned earlier, William Shatner's Starfleet Ensemble from Generations, and that starts at $8,000. And it's just gorgeous. You know, the, you know, everything Shatner wore was gorgeous. He just wears it so well. And um, He was a small man, too. That's the most amazing but thing. But large in stature. That's right. You know, now it kills me that I gave all his wardrobe from Free Enterprise to Planet Hollywood can. I should have saved it and given it to you. Pay for my kid's college education. Um, well, we'll sell some Free Enterprise scripts if you'd like. Oh, well, there you go. There. Did Greg have any of those? Probably. I should have given it to Greg at least. Sell um, the script to Free Enterprise too. What, what about you, Ashley? I mean, you've heard some of the things that are at auction. What do you wish you could have from this amazing auction? Keeping in mind, we haven't even talked about Lost in Space stuff, Green Hornet stuff, Commander yeah, Cody, and there's the... Uh, I avoided intentionally. The Lost in Space ATV. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the chariot, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, look, I know there are a lot of Lost in Space fans out there. You were not yeah. one of them. Not so much. I, I would like Steve Austin's original arm from the $6 million man, the one they had to remove and replace. Oh, That's what oh, I would be it, looking for. Yeah, well, you know... Uh, the one covered in meat. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, I think Lee Majors is going to be auctioning think it he's off. Attached but, to it? Uh, he says, I got it. Well, we are in Austin, after <laughs> that, all. That's right. A $6 million man. What, what, like, what about you? If money was no option, let, let's just say, what, of the stuff we talked about, what are some of the things you would love to have and, and why? Like, is it to do it nostalgia? Is it because you want to have it to give to your kids? Is it because it's just something so special to you? Or you, you're, you're, you're so fascinated by film and TV? I'm just curious or why... Or is it because you want to do unnatural things with it? And that's a valid answer, because it's your shit now. Go ahead. I think for me, it's Botany Bay. Botany Bay? <laughs> Sorry. But when that was made, and Greg made it, he made the Botany Bay. He didn't make the Botany Bay. Um, the, the guys on the original show did, because Greg never worked on the original show, but he was around. But you know what else they have? If you can't afford the Botany Bay, there's something a little cheaper, which you may want, the SETI eel. Right. You right? can put it in your that, that box. It'll make you do things. Tell lies. The mother. <laughs> Tell it's very large. It's, ma it's it, mounted, It enters as through the ears and wraps themselves around the cerebral cortex. Rendering you quite susceptible to suggestion. Now tell yes. me. Where is Admiral Kirk? <laughs> um, okay, sorry, we, we went off on a little tangent there. I'm getting the Vulcan loop. I mean, uh, you know, that, that's a special piece. 
And you're wearing a Jason shirt? Isbell shirt, you too, so you're a musically yeah. interested man. You, yeah. Absolutely. Would you play Smoke on the Water by Deep Purple on it? <laughs> no, because everyone does, you know. <laughs> what was the story you On the Vulcan Lear? Oh, yeah, Robert, you I, must I, know. I don't know offhand. Okay. It's, it's not cheap, but it's not, a, it's not a stormtrooper. It's somewhere in between. Be watchful of young men in their velvet prime. Sorry, that's enough. <laughs> Are you going to give us a full rendition I of I could have gone my whole life without hearing that song one more time. Yeah. It's, it's a beaut- it. It's, Nimoy wrote it. It's called Maiden Wine, and it's on one of his albums. And every time he says wine, it <laughs> weirds me out. I don't know why. It's like hearing people say the word moist. I don't sing wine. Um, <laughs> Anyone else? Other, other thought? Yeah. So funny mm. that I know. It's so funny. I'm such a huge Star Trek fan, and yet I'm more excited about the Galactica stuff. So it's just like, what the hell? There's something wrong with me, clearly. Because you could use it to, to ride a motorcycle, right? You can use it to a uh, flying motorcycle. Uh, yeah. It's not as sturdy as, uh, as you'd like to think it is, but yes, you, yeah. you could wear it. I don't How know if it would like save that? you. You buy it now, and, you know, and most people obviously get insurance. It's like great works of art where you get insurance, right? But say, say you know, you're just a fan. You buy it. And like, you know, a, a, a month later, your kid's playing around with it. Like, perhaps my kid, when I bought, like, expensive hot toys and sideshow toys, and all of a sudden I can't find my Blofeld, and I find out my kid is using it as Lex Luthor. That's messed up, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, anyway. Other other, other things, yes? Uh, See, a lot of Galactica yeah, here. It's very flattering, you know? It kind of gives you a nice little V shape. Which is no, V is something else entirely. Oh, yeah. That V shape <laughs> is more like a lizard. It gave Jane Badler or not. Anyway. Yeah. Um, other, yeah. The brass, brass monkey from Tales of the Gold Monkey. <laughs> the brass that, the monkey, beast monkey. The, the Beast Boys beat you to it. Monkey? I bet he did. <laughs> he had it on his back. Glenn Larson. Man, I could tell you, well, you know, Glenn Larson stories. It, it, the Glenn Larson stories in my book, uh, So Say We All, man. Oh, he was, he was one in a million, that guy. He had this limo. He went everywhere in this giant stretch limo. And like, even when he was going to lunch, he would go from Universal to the, the restaurant, which was literally across the street. He'd have to take his limo. It took more to get in the limo and take the limo across the street. And then he talks about, his kid talks about going on the Universal Studio tour in the limo. So they were driving to like the six million dollar man tunnel instead of on a, in the tram in the limo. I, wow. He was a one that was a Glenn Larson man, but he had this is back in the day when nobody was striking because writers had more money than God back then. If I was working back in the day, Glenn Larson, we, we would be buying everything in this catalog, right? Yeah. Now yeah, it's you'd like be, you'd be writing at seven years old. Yeah, I would be writing at seven <laughs> years old. But you know what? I was. But that was the perfect level of writing Reboots for some of Glenn Larson's shows. Easy. <laughs> I'm not saying Galactica. I'm, I'm saying some of the other shows, like uh, Nightman. Okay. Uh, other, any, any other thoughts yet back there? Yeah, a ton. Yeah. Robert, you, we talked about Space 1999. He was saying Jerry Anderson, other shows that... We have a ton of Space 1999. We have all the ships yeah. from Space 1999. We have the costumes. We have props. There's all kinds of stuff from Space... I would want an eagle. That's what I would want. I don't know. But you had... Uh, oh, we got a lot of Thunderbirds. Yeah. We, oh, my God. A lot. And there were, I think there was Thunderbirds other, must go. Other Jerry Anderson shows. Let me look. Um, it's probably in session one, because that stuff. But there's some oh, Space 1999 there. The Thunderbirds are going stuff is in the. There's the Planet of the Apes stuff I missed. Well, there's um, there's Charlton Heston's NASA outfit or. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, not NASA. It's uh, codpiece. See. Yeah. It's different. It's uh, U.S. Something space USCA. agency. It's USCA. two three words, three letters. YMC. But it says no, Taylor no, no, no. on it. It's really quite lovely. Taylor. You know, it's crazy. I skipped over to the Star Wars stuff and went right to Galactica. What the what? That's just nuts. Well, to me, the Star Wars thing that I think is really amazing is he had that original production binder with the mm-hmm. with that very first Ralph McQuarrie logo from 1976 on it, which is all the special effects shots in order. It's yeah. the storyboarded Star Wars. See, that's why there's so much to learn. Uh, but there is a... We haven't even talked about the Surak yet. I'm from right. Star Trek, the oh. motion picture. The Vulcan shuttle. I, you had to bring that up. That's such a sore spot. I looked to see how much that was. I'm not getting it. <laughs> I mean, part of me, you know, hears us having this conversation about all of these things. 
And all I can hear in the back of my head is, um, it belongs in a museum, right? But a lot of museums do bid on right. this, don't a they? A lot of museums do bid on this stuff, but a lot of places, like we just had an auction from a guy named James Commissar, right. who was trying to open a television history museum. We had the All in the Family set. Mm -hmm. We had Did you the play bar. Dirk Commissar when he opened the auction? What's that? Dirk Commissar? We did not. No, okay. Never I mind. twitch even when I think about it now. But we had the Cheers bar, the entire wow. bar from Cheers, with Kirstie Alley's name scratched into it, Rhea Perlman, Woody Harrelson. And for years, and we had Johnny Carson set, we had Letterman's late night set, and we had all of these costumes and props, but James had tried to open a museum. Museums are very difficult to open. Yeah. They're even harder to maintain. So yes, some of this stuff does belong in the Smithsonian. Some of this stuff should absolutely be in a museum. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is, there's too much stuff out there to fit it into any number of museums that it would be appropriate for. So that's why collectors, and look, collectors are not just collectors. Mm -hmm. They are caretakers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They are custodians. Mm -hmm. Because without Greg, this stuff wouldn't exist to auction to the next generation, as it were, Absolutely. of collectors. So it's not just like, oh my God, that guy hoarded and kept and, and, and wouldn't share. Yeah, he, and he preserved. He preserved it. Like preserved it. it. He preserved it <laughs> and he conserved it. Yeah. He took care of this stuff in a way that only somebody who deeply and profoundly loved this material would care for it. That's why it exists. That's why it's in this catalog. That's why you can see it. And the fact is, if you just come see it, and again, I'm not even sure I'm supposed to invite everybody listening to your podcast. <laughs> but if you want to come to Heritage on October 13th, there will be a party. There will be all of Greg's friends. I will be moderating a panel with Lou Zutavern. I think John Eves will be there. A lot Did you say of October or September? October 13th. Okay. October. The auction is the 14th. September 13th is when the moon blasted out of orbit. Yes. So we're going to have all these guys there talking about Greg, talking about model making, talking about Star Trek, and all of this other science fiction cinema history. And all of these things will be out for people to look at. We're going to serve Romulan Ale. We'll serve all the good stuff. Sure, get them liquored up before they have to bid. Good idea. How do well, you get that across even, the neutral it's not zone. even until the next day. Like, okay. we should serve Romulan Ale on the 14th. But no, <laughs> on the 13th we're going to do it because we're very decent people. And by the way, if you haven't heard our memorial to Greg Jean on the podcast from a year and a half ago, uh, Bill George was our guest on that, the brilliant visual effects supervisor, model maker, and just a fantastic talent. Um, and you should check it out. It's a great it's called Remembering Greg Jean, so you should check I that out. I listened to it, and I thought it was fantastic. It helped me write the piece I had to write about Greg. Oh, good. oh thank you. On the, it's on Inglorious Treasures. Now, I want to read this description. I want to see who can guess first what this item is. Vintage original white polyester satin piece ensemble, including one sleeve pullover ribbed v neck tunic with detachable collar and embroidered. Aaron Gray's costume on Buck Rogers. Yeah, it is. It is. Visual imagination, man. I'm very <laughs> disturbed that you knew that that quickly. Starting bid 2000. I was like, name that tune, except it's name that outfit. Remember, um, we had Erin Gray on our podcast as a special non-Star Trek guest, and she was luminous, and she was very sweet, and she told lots of uh, fun stories about uh, Buck Rogers and other things. Well, yeah. she used to manage Michelle Nichols, too, right? That's correct. She did. She did. Um, I got to tell you, I'm so excited about this auction, and um, Robert was, like I said, kind enough to bring these mini catalogs, so if you haven't got one, you should check it out. A and box um, right in the corner of the uh, And uh, it'll be announced officially on September 8th, uh, the anniversary of... Um, of the United States premiere of Star Trek. The United States premiere of Star Canada Trek. Because Canada had it, what, two days early? On NBC. Um, this is just a remarkable collection uh, of a remarkable individual, and uh, we're never going to see anything like this again. You'll see pieces that are fantastic, but never this many spectacular pieces from so many in things. One place. It's no, Joe Maddalena, our executive vice president, who's in charge of this particular auction, he reminds me daily that this is a once-in-a-lifetime event. We have entertainment memorabilia auctions, some significant collections all the time. But to have all of Greg's material mm -hmm. and have all of this history, again, spanning Laurel and Hardy, Commander Cody, all the way to Star Wars V, certainly Battlestar Galactica, and this 
extraordinary repository of Star Trek material, which everybody in this room, especially the guy wearing the mirror mirror vest back there, <laughs> uh, will profoundly fall in love with. It's something that I, I can't get beyond. And, and again, I never imagined I'd work in the auction world. But it's for auctions like this one that I'm very glad that I do. Oh, that's great. Well, I want to. Are there any last questions before we wrap up? Yep. Is the full auction catalog that you're looking through available? It will be available September 11th. It is, again, the auction opens on Friday, September 8th. So the 11th, and uh, if you email me at robertwhha.com, I will make sure that I get you and everybody listening a catalog. Nice. And they ain't cheap. And I'm going to get it to you for free. Oh, that's great. Yes. Um, so, one there is the preview. Hmm? Yeah. Oh, you won't be able to touch it. <laughs> well, you, your husband is certainly, you and your husband are v my invited guests to Heritage Auctions on Valley View and 183 in Dallas, Texas to come by and see it. Well, the best part is we're n very close to DFW Airport, so you just have to fly in, look at the stuff, and fly out, or spend a really lovely day in my hometown of Dallas. Or if you have an X-Wing, you can just sort of... <laughs> um, oh, just don't fly. Um, if you throw them hard enough, they do. Is there a Tronya bottle? I don't believe there is. From Corp my Maneuver. No, because remember, it was served in a punch bowl. <laughs> yeah. That's Clint why Howard this is my favorite. In that this punch is, bowl, I gotta tell way. you guys, this is why this is the only podcast I will listen to. Oh, you. you speak my language. <laughs> we speak fluently, e but and you're way. It takes it to a level that I can't even begin to imagine Insanity. one day achieving. Yeah. But it's really remarkable. And like I said, I've, I've I've known Mark's work and certainly your work, Darren, for years. And big fan of all of it. So you guys it's are doing incredible hell that we've known each other for so many years. And and I was thinking, and you know, the way that Robert was reintroduced to us um, was that our good friend Ryan Condell, all of us, who um, does not only is he the showrunner of House of the Dragon, but he does a fantastic podcast called. Um, uh, the stuff dreams are made of. The stuff dreams are made of with David Mandel from Veep, and um, that they will be in the office. Plumber. They will be in the office for several days this week. Yeah, nice. and, and they are so. Um, uh, you know, they have both of them have a spectacular collection. I know Ryan would be very upset if I mentioned some of the things he has. He's very um, security. Conscious. They just did a big Forbes piece on those guys and their collection. They're 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 really great guys. And um, Ryan said to Heritage, you should really talk to the Trexperts, uh, you know, since there's so much um, Star Trek stuff. And obviously, Robert, having known Darren and, and known me, it was so great. Because I mean, when did I talk to? Was it about Deep Space Nine or Voyager? We or? talked about. I went back and reread the piece the other day. It was from. <laughs> 1999. Oh it, was the Salon, it was the Salon piece that I did about, it was the death of Star Trek, basically. It was about, it was essentially you pitching your Wild Bunch idea for Star Trek. Oh, God. And it was also, you were not the world's biggest Rick Berman fan in that article. No. Yes. <laughs> but I went back and read it and went, I mean, I don't, you know. I've changed my opinion of Rick a bit because having now been a showrunner myself, I have a lot more appreciation for what he went through. Um, and having seen Star Trek since then, I have a lot more appreciation for what he accomplished. Um, but at the same time, he did stuff that I don't agree with in terms of the way he treated people. Uh, Nimoy especially. Nimoy talked about that in the piece. Yeah, well, Nimoy was very bitter about the way the whole Generations thing was Correct. handled. But Nimoy could be difficult, too. But uh, he, he, Nimoy was not um, vindictive and mean. You know, and, and I understand Rick was under a lot of pressure doing multiple shows, but there's a way to treat people who work for you, and there's a way not to. And, you know, I just don't believe, and I know you don't run shows like that either. So, but I do have a lot more respect for Rick and a lot more understanding for Rick than maybe I did in 1999 when I was a young punk who had done one movie at that yeah, no nothing. <laughs> um, well, that was how I got him, Leonard, to talk to me for the piece, was I sent him the thing about, you know, how Rick Berman killed Star Trek, and he immediately called me back. 
<laughs> you're, you're totally right. <laughs> Actually, I said we, I read the letter was something about the death of Star Trek because at that point it seemed that it might be sort of nearing its end. And he thought that was a hilarious premise. He called me and began reading the letter to me over the phone while laughing hysterically, oh which is a very That's unnerving yeah. experience to have. He's a laughing Vulcan. He was Star affected Trek, by the spores. Star Trek oh. is not dead, but it's not breathing very well. <laughs> But he, I guess he and John DeLancey just at that time were doing the Cube right. Oh, right. audio book, that too. So right. audio book it was a very interesting period that I got to meet you, and then when you and I met doing Star Trek The Motion Picture, uh, the director's cut. Crazy. Long time ago. But it's the way, you know, it's interesting that, you know, these eddies and currents in time bring us together right. after all, I mean, this is a long time, 1999, mm -hmm. and that we're all, you know, reunited again by Greg. Yeah. You know, which was something he did in his lifetime, bringing right. people together, you know, who had this shared passion for this thing called Star Trek and Battlestar Galactica. And Batman. This, and Batman. this catalog represents a life of love and fandom and art and so many things that uh, are lost now that Greg's gone, but at least we have this representation of his journey. Yeah. And listen, uh, thank you for making the journey to this panel. We know it's late, and thanks for sticking it out. Um, we have a couple panels tomorrow, Walter Koenig and Terry Farrell and uh, Armin Sherman tomorrow. I hope you'll join us for that. We'll be at our booth tomorrow if you want to pick up some of my books. Or yes, get, the booth. Uh, uh, honorary Trexpert certificate signed or um, uh, post free posters. We give away all that stuff for free other than my books. We'll also, <laughs> if you have friends who want to pick up a few of the remaining catalogs, we'll have that as well. And um, as always, you can listen to Inglorious Trexperts every Thursday, wherever you listen to podcasts. But, you know, thank, I hope you enjoyed your first can Galaxy Con in Austin because they do great shows. Uh, Mike and his team are fantastic. There's always growing pains with the new show, but hopefully they'll be here for a long time to come. This is a great convention. Yeah. Can I ask a silly question? Is there anybody here who doesn't have Mark's books? Like you're See? here. You should have Mark's books. They like, don't. The 50-year mission is in a, the starting bid. It's fourteen thousand dollars. <laughs> Sold. <laughs> I, uh, no, actually, with, if you do have a chance, you come down. Um, I'm happy to sign them. And, you know, I, it, it sounds disingenuous, but they're really good books. So, I, um, As someone who's not employed by him, <laughs> they are really good books. Thank you, Robert. I, and from a journalist like yourself, that, that means a lot. I, I was very lucky. The books did extremely well, and, and people have been very kind, and the reviews have been great. But it was a real labor of love, and I think part of it was because I got pulled back in to Star Trek because I kind of kept saying no to doing these books, and I got convinced to do it. And then once I did it, I was all in. And um, I was very envious because, as a, as a writer, there are very few books that I'd like to do. The kind of journalism that you did about the history of Star Trek is that kind of book. And then people ask, "Are you going to do Volume Three on the new shows?" I'm like, no. I'll Although do it. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, um, I'm kind of uh, softening my stance on that. <laughs> because we might now, after Picard season three, I might be willing to. So we'll see. Anyway, oh, yeah, go ahead. Is there anybody you wanted to get from the oral interviews that you did? Well, um, people were dead. Um, so quite a few, have. basically. Gene <laughs> <laughs> right. um, no, Kuhn. I, I have to say. Are you there? Uh, <laughs> I have to say, um, the, the person I was trying to get for the longest period of time was Rick Berman, who kept turning us down. He was my wife. <laughs> Gee, now. I can't imagine why. And, and, and you know, at the, and a, a bunch of people, like Brandon and everybody, said, you really should talk to Mark. And I, and I kept saying, yeah, you should really have him talk to me, because I had a lot of people on the record who said, you know, pretty not good things things about him, and I wanted him to, you know, explain from his perspective, because I, I thought it was actually somewhat unfair and one-sided. I wanted Rick to have his piece, and Rick finally said yes, and he said, but, you know, I'm only going to talk to you for a half hour. You know, four hours later, or whatever it was, uh, he said, well, thanks. I said, you were my white whale, and he said, well, you finally got your, harpooned your white whale, and he was great, and I was really glad That's that hot. I was able to balance out some of the criticisms. Uh, of uh, of Rick that were leveled by some of the people that he worked with, and I, I felt it was a lot more fair 
uh, to him than it would have been had he not participated. So I was very happy to have Rick. And I actually have a pretty good relationship with Rick these days. Um, but, you know, as they say, time heals all wounds. I mean, Mike Pillar used to call me the Antichrist of Star Trek, but Michael was a sweetheart. And, you know, Michael, I always loved. And even when I was being critical of the show, he never took it personal. I mean, I remember when Free Enterprise, to, I invited him to the premiere, and he was there with, you know, with Sandra. He was there, you know, because he never resented, even if, like, I said, this season of Voyager was a travesty of a mockery of a sham, you know, whatever I would say about it. And he, he, but he, he would argue it with me. He would say, I think you're wrong. But um, he was he was great, and I love that about him because a lot of people are very thin-skinned, including me, <laughs> about criticism, and you know aren't as forgiving as somebody like Mike Pillar, who is just an extraordinary man who I have so much respect for. Buy the books. Oh, there you go. That's amazing. And then uh, read them. Any, Don't just any collect. Any final them. words about this? He doesn't break. care if you read them. You can just buy them. This is. <laughs> I do care. I care. <laughs> um, this is a Greg Jean panel. And Darren, why don't you finish by just a few words uh, um, about you know uh, our honored uh, departed dead? I'm just happy that uh, people will be able to share not only in the catalog, but uh, you know, people will be able to take care of these things now, and uh, and to enrich their own lives. Uh, with uh, what he treasured. And I think that's a great thing. And it, it continues the line from the original creation on through into the future. And it reminds people who Greg was. Absolutely. Because the fact of the matter is, the reason the AP is doing the story was because the writer at the AP wasn't so, in I don't think she's ever seen Star Trek. I don't think she'd ever seen Close Encounters. But she was fascinated to know about who Greg was mm -hmm. because he had worked on so many things that she did know, mm -hmm. that she did love, and she was very interested. He'd done something in a craft that is quickly disappearing, yeah. making these miniatures. She loved the idea of talking about and talking to all of these guys about somebody who made this little shack from 1941 that looked enormous on the screen, and Devil's Tower for that matter. That's right. So, we don't have the Ferris wheel from that. We do not have the Ferris wheel, but we have the, the bait shack and we have the John Belushi's airplane. Well, you have the Japanese submarine? We do not. Okay. We have some V'ger. But the they have Christopher Lee. The great thing, is, <laughs> the great yep. thing is he's really not dead as long as we remember him. I'm not going to say another word. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Uh, we really appreciate it. We'll see you soon. Thank you, everybody. Tomorrow you. or at another great GalaxyCon. Good night.